Imagine you're me, on your way home with a copy of this weird-looking game called Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. Well, weird is what your older brother's friends called it. To you, it was nothing short of heaven. The GameCube was my virtual safe haven, its tiny disc so endearing to me even as a child. What was more endearing were the stories it played for me. It's one thing to be regaled with tales of heroism. It is another to be consumed entirely by the music, the characters, and the lands of one. The same thing happened to me over a decade later with Breath of the Wild. I'm not ashamed to admit that I cried. I cannot be more thankful for what this series has given me. And I do very little for Breath of the Wild by saying its emotional core is humanity's sense of curiosity. So, when I found out that Tears of the Kingdom was officially in development in 2019, I became the Vicky who played Wind Waker for the first time all over again. Hi, it's me, Vicky. I don't mean to start every single video I do with a brooding intro, but I thought it was appropriate since Legend of Zelda has a very strong place in my heart. It's, you know, really common for a lot of us weebs to talk about the connection we have to anime and video games, but Legend of Zelda for me has always been a ballad about the depths of humanity's curiosity like I mentioned in the intro of this video. I always thought it was impressive how this was a game that could trick you into taking it slow, getting to know other people, understanding the lay of the land. It's kind of my introduction to what I love the most in a lot of these JRPGs, which is puzzle solving, especially as a child because, my god, was it almost impossible to solve any of the puzzles in Wind Waker unless you had one of those guides which my cousin stole from me, and he insists to this day that he never stole it from me, but that's just something that I will seek out in my future will. Anyway, I wanted to elaborate on some of the character designs that we've seen in the trailers and some of the hints that may lead to possible future plot developments. And just to avoid this being an absolute info dump of Legend of Zelda lore and history of artistic decisions that led to Tears of the Kingdom's character designs, I will be drawing the bulk of my sources from Tears of the Kingdom's 2019, 2021, and 2023 trailer. There will also be references to other games such as Orcarina of Time, Twilight- No, I mispronounced Ocarina! It was 3 a.m. when I made this recording! Twilight Princess, Hyrule Warriors, and Skyward Sword to define the possible character design decisions in Tears of the Kingdom. We'll also be elaborating on the possible lore of the Zonai and the relationship to current day Hyrule. At the time of recording and editing this, I have accepted that I will not be able to afford a $70 game, so I will be avoiding any and all spoilers for Tears of the Kingdom. If you want to avoid any of the concept art leaks, even though you're playing the game right now, or maybe you're saving yourself, then proceed with caution. But before we move forward, I do want to set forth my theory about the Zonai people. I believe they are a prehistoric tribe of people who are tasked with the burden of sealing demise, or Calamity Ganon, depending on whether or not that part of the Zelda timeline is connected to this one. Though we don't get to see Hylia's true form, just statues, I get this feeling that she was a goddess originally worshipped by the Zonai until she was later adopted as the primary goddess of the current Hylians. As early as the 2019 teaser, a glowing glove clad in a golden gauntlet tries to suppress the resurgence of Calamity Ganon. This resembles the gauntlet Link wears in the other Tears of the Kingdom trailers, and the gold patterns are similar to the ones found in the Zonai ruins. And going off the advanced tech of Link's gauntlet, and the Sky Islands that were apparently created by the Zonai and are also featured in Skyward Sword, we can assume that they're an advanced race who suddenly disappeared over thousands of years ago. Or you can say that they're Sky Atlanteans. There are hints of their presence throughout Breath of the Wild in the form of ruins, art, and armor. Their aesthetic seems to be Aztec-inspired as we can see from the bold geometric line work, and thick beveled curves that dominate their ruins and sculptures. Which is fitting considering that the Aztecs were a sophisticated civilization before white men happened. So it should be no surprise that the Zonai appear to be set up similar to the Aztecs. Their design sensibilities seem deeply rooted in nature using natural materials such as stone, wood, and minerals to craft jewelry. And Zelda sponsoring a couple pieces in the pre-launch trailer as we can see, and hey, this Zonai woman is decked out in something similar. Perhaps this is Nintendo's way of telling us that the Zonai were an extremely powerful race that destroyed itself in its self-fulfilled prophecy of stopping Ganondorf at all cost. I've teased your balls about it enough already. Let's just get right into it.
Link's Breath of the Wild design was met with a salad bowl of mixed responses, exuberant excitement, confusion, and utter denial. And I do get it, seeing as how green is a color that has been associated with Link since the series' infancy, a color that serves as a visual connection to the Kokiri of Ocarina of Time's plot, I said it right this time, shut up, which is then carried over to Wind Waker as the garb of the hero of time bestowed upon young boys who have come of age, its Skyward Sword as a graduation uniform, and then Twilight Princess from Farron upon stepping in as the new hero of time. Uh... Yeah, there's a long history. Henceforth, I can understand the perspective of those who were initially critics of Link's blue tunic and more gender-ambiguous features. And I can still understand critics who have staunchly maintained their position, because that's how good and iconic Link's character design has been since the beginning. Because green is a color associated with safety, nature, vitality, and luck, I believe this association is fitting for Link and why people were so vehemently against changing his color palette. Link's iconic green tunic is earthly, sprite-like as it binds Link to the verdant life of Hyrule, one whose peace he attempts to protect and uphold until his end days. Personally, when I first saw Link's design in the first Breath of the Wild teaser trailer, I thought it was a throwback to his lobster tunic from Wind Waker, but it turned out that this is what is called the Champion's Tunic. The base tunic serves as a symbol of his affiliation with the Kingdom of Hyrule and his intimate ties to Zelda, which is a fantastic way of building a community where Link is involved where he's not acting as a lone hero of time during his fight against Ganondorf. Um, at first. In comparison to, say, the likes of Twilight Princess where the design was at its peak in practicality and style, what with its olive green tunic layered with a hauberk and white colored undershirt and his multiple ear piercings, Breath of the Wild Link feels somewhat naked, yet ruggedly efficient. Even to the non-discerning eye, it's obvious that Link's silhouette is significantly sleeker, his striking blue tunic wearing the visage of his weapon of choice, as it's draped over a white patterned undershirt, light brown trousers, leather boots, and fingerless gloves with two belts for sword and bow and arrows. Interestingly, most of the promo art featuring Link for Breath of the Wild has him using a bow and arrow instead of the Master Sword. Which in my opinion makes sense because Breath of the Wild is already trying to revamp their long-standing formula for Link. Also, who was going to tell me that Shigeru Miyamoto admitted that Peter Pan, the Disney Peter Pan, was a point of inspiration for Link's design because he wanted to make Link look as iconic as possible? To elaborate, the outfit is bare in its construction, appearing more like an oversized t-shirt with the defense of one rather than legitimate armor such as Twilight Princess. In a sense, I would argue that Nintendo's intentions with Breath of the Wild's revamp of Link's classic style is to recontextualize Link as a struggling knight, fighting his way to get back to the side of his princess rather than a hero chosen by a higher power. I also believe this was to allow for greater outfit customizations for the player base. You can mix and match outfits in other games, again like Twilight Princess, but once you switch to a new outfit, then you're locked into it. But I've been annoying for long enough, so let's dive into what we've seen in the trailers. As we can deduce from the trailers, it is telling a story of where Zelda and Link have been unfortunately separated following the inciting incident of Ganondorf's revival. And during this time period, because of Link's long hair and disheveled Greco-Roman appearance, we can assume he has had to lean into his hunter roots as a form of self-defense. Link's hair length is like a gauge of how much shit this boy has been through, I promise you. Originally, he was a blonde twink, well, he's still a twink, with short, side-swept hair. And then it was tied into a ponytail in Breath of the Wild. In Tears of the Kingdom, Link's hair is wild with the way it sways heroically in his pose, now hitting his shoulders. This single-strap white tunic reminds me of a male chiton, or in other words, a tunic that fastens at the shoulder originally worn by women and men. The chiton is a versatile article of clothing valued for its simplicity. Obviously, this provides an advantage to a wayward Link who separates from his friends and far from home. The leather gladiator sandals tie the Grecian aesthetic together, and its lightweight construction matches the rest of Link's threadbare ensemble. Tying together Link's outfit is a half-green tunic with triangular-shaped tassels and a yellow dotted pattern. There seems to be a strong relationship between these dotted patterns and the wooden beaded belt tying his chiton and tunic together. If we compare Tears of the Kingdom Link to Breath of the Wild Link, there's a world of difference in the lifestyle Link has experienced. Like I mentioned earlier, Breath of the Wild Link is a stoic knight who has sworn fealty to Zelda and the Kingdom of Hyrule. The entirety of his armor set in Breath of the Wild was a manifestation of his unshakable loyalty to Zelda and her cause taking it on as his own. Now when we compare Tears of the Kingdom Link to Breath of the Wild, Link now seems like a struggling vagabond whose tattered clothing is basically just a shadow of what he used to be. Before I jump ahead, I noticed that his belt bore strong resemblance to the beaded jewelry found on Zelda and this mystery Zonai woman. However, I would be remiss to say that that is the only piece of Zonai references on him because there is his wooden shield. Now, if we look closely, there are symbols on it that are similar to the one seen on the ruins scattered throughout the Faron region and the underground crypt where Ganondorf's corpse was found. When we take this into consideration and the introduction of Link's Ultra Hand, his seemingly new blue arm clad in gold, there's a clear connection between the advanced 
advanced technology of Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. I've been able to pull a handful of their images of the Ultra Hand, and from what I can see, it's like a new arm covered in a blue glow with sharp nails and golden runes. As the pattern runs off, the closer it gets to Link's armpit, the blue is broken into geometric shapes, similar to the ones found in the Zonai ruins. These runes are also similar to the white tattoos decorating the skin of the mysterious Zonai woman. Maybe this is a sign of those touched by divinity within Zonai culture. Like we briefly touched upon, Link gets himself into a Prince Ashitaka situation where the strands of light that bound the Ultra Hand are now latching on to his right arm. It visibly hurts him, much like the curse that affected Prince Ashitaka's right arm. Now because I'm too poor to enjoy life and I can't confirm this without playing the game, I'm going to assume that Link may be experiencing the same struggles as Prince Ashitaka. He becomes ostracized from society by the cursed arm now ravaging his body. I can sense the dramatic irony of Link, who has this seemingly godlike weapon of mass destruction capable of sealing Ganondorf, now embarking on a journey of self-discovery to protect the people of Hyrule and all races scattered throughout the kingdom. The noticeably darker and foreboding tones of Tears of the Kingdom embedded itself into the bones of anyone who watched the 2019 trailer. Link's new design, funny enough, is a physical embodiment of the title Breath of the Wild. He dives fully into the aesthetics of the fleet-footed hunter looking like a warrior that does not share a direct callback to the kingdom he still faithfully serves. Tears of the Kingdom's Link is the actualization of his journey to uncover the secrets that now plague his existence, and how he can weaponize that to protect his kingdom and friends. During my research for this video, I came across a very interesting quote from the video series released by Nintendo, The Making of Breath of the Wild. There was an interesting quote about Zelda's development. That being about how the developers were trying to draw an emotional connection between the player base and Zelda. Creating the question that needs to be answered. Why does Zelda need to be saved? Upon hearing this concept put into words, it made me think about the classical structure of the Super Mario game, where saving the princess was already an accepted part of the formula, therefore objectifying the princess. And honestly, that's a topic for a whole other video essay, but I'm going to leave it at that. In the early stages of the Super Mario games, Princess Peach was not given much characterization. Instead, we are directly told by the game that in order to succeed, we need to save the princess. Therefore, if we were to replace her with any other object, as long as it completes the objective of the game, then that's all that matters. However, as largely told through Zelda's shape language, which is largely comprised of circles, we understand that Zelda is a vulnerable and kind and empathetic princess who will give everything to her friends and her family if it means protecting the kingdom of Hyrule from Calamity Ganon. This is not to discredit past iterations of Zelda in any way, namely that of Twilight Princess, which I can see as being the polar opposite of this version of Zelda. While Twilight Princess's Zelda looks like she is an assortment of thorns who could puncture Breath of the Wild Zelda easily, Breath of the Wild Zelda is composed of circles. She's soft, she's smooth, she's something that you want to protect because almost anything can blemish her. And this is paired phenomenally with the writing as we can't help but dote on this person who is willing to work herself to the bone in order to harness the energy of a god goddess that is supposed to belong to her. Zelda is soft, composed largely of circles, almost as if she is so easy to blemish if anything were to touch her. And this is demonstrated in the way that she interacts with her champions as well, always finding ways to spend time with them while still upholding her princessly duties, extending herself far beyond the reach of any normal human capacity, but one that she is willing to do because she is the princess of Hyrule, and we can't help but love her for it. Zelda still retains all of her signature physical features, a heart-shaped face, blue eyes, blonde hair, and highly in ears. However, they are significantly softened compared to earlier incarnations such as Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword. This is also one of the few mainline titles to feature multiple outfits for Zelda outside of her customary princess gown. Her field scouting outfit, which we just saw for travel and research, the highly addressed for prayer sessions, the formal gown for customary purposes, and the snow outfit. As a way to indicate that this Zelda is grappling with multiple identities, Breath of the Wild gives her the largest closet to choose from. This addresses a culmination of the roles Zelda has played in past games as a princess Princess, companion, and goddess incarnate. Now, as we can see, for example, from Breath of the Wild, and of the four outfits, the one that we see most often is her scouting outfit. Breath of the Wild's iteration focused on presenting a delicate inventor with scholarly pursuits, but her loyalty to her kingdom, family, and friends stays all the same. This devotion is evident in the recurring Triforce symbolism found through her accessories and clothing such as the cuff of her boots and the band beneath her chest. Basically, her scouting outfit is just a repurposed version of the ball gown, except it lacks the skirt and is now replaced by brown riding boots and black tights. There is also her gown, which her scout outfit borrows a lot of the same aesthetics from. The gown more so resembles medieval formal wear with its elongated bell sleeves with a puffy cinch at the shoulders. 
and a tiered skirt that begins mid-waist. An extravagant and thickly woven girdle belt sits atop her skirt, and there seems to be a strong motif of nature as leaf flourishes can be seen on her sleeves and the girdle belt. The dress, much like her scouting outfit, is layered with a cotton layer underneath the primary blue layer, creating a conservative image of dress to promote feminine modesty. Overall, it is a demonstrably clear attempt at synthesizing historical aesthetics, such as medieval ball gowns. The high collar obscures any trace of skin along her neck while also creating the illusion of a longer neck. I mentioned the visual similarities between her scouting outfit and her medieval gown earlier, not in any way to point out that there was a lazy recycling of aesthetics, but rather to show how Zelda is a very practical individual. But again, I would be remiss if I only focused on these outfits, because as we can see, the Hylia gown also plays a large and important role in her character writing. Aside from it being a gorgeous strapless floor-length gown with an empire waistline, the Hylia dress in a way is like a sick reminder of what Zelda needs to become. Whereas the scouting outfit and the Hylia gown is a representation of Zelda's duties as princess and scholar, the Hylia gown instead is a reminder of the goddess that she must become in order to protect her kingdom. The Hylia gown wraps Zelda head to toe in a white holy glow. As we all know, white is the color of purity. And just like her previous outfits, Zelda also has callbacks to her family as well as the Triforce. So when we look at a combination of all of her Breath of the Wild outfits, we have to ask ourselves, is she able of supporting all of these expectations on her shoulders alone? Well, no. She needs our help. And honestly, because of that writing paired with the design, I think they did a great job of making her someone vulnerable who we need to help. Before I dive into what we've seen from the Tears of the Kingdom trailer, I really want to talk about how there was a conscious decision in order to design Zelda with no weapon in Breath of the Wild in compared to past iterations. For example, Twilight Princess's Zelda wields a Rikasso blade and the Bow of Light. Now, in comparison to Breath of the Wild Zelda, she's quite the Torde force when it comes to raw firepower. Breath of the Wild Zelda does not wield any weapons aside from the protective energies of the Light Force, which is still a boon to have, but there isn't really anything in raw firepower that she can use in order to fight alongside her champions aside from that. She is more of a guardian and a symbol of wisdom, if anything. I would argue that in Breath of the Wild, Zelda is the closest thing that we have to a symbol of inspiration when fighting against Calamity Ganon and the forces of evil overall. Now, in the past iterations of Zelda, she was a more solid figure, a physical form, a representation of her kingdom. So I think it's just so fascinating that in Breath of the Wild, they made this very human character who can somehow be an abstraction of purity and justice prevailing against evil. So how about we dive into Tears of the Kingdom's design now? When the 2019 teaser trailer for Tears of the Kingdom debuted, we get to see Zelda with a whole new haircut and a new arsenal. And if media has taught me anything, this means that Zelda is going to go through some really big character development. Now, obviously, when a character goes through any type of change in their design, that's supposed to be akin to a metamorphosis for a butterfly. Everyone was losing their goddamn minds. I remember my brother literally took time out of his schedule to call me just to talk about how cute Zelda looked. I'm glad we prioritize the right things in this family. But for any new fans, you also have to take this into consideration about why everyone was freaking the fuck out about Zelda's new haircut. One, it's cute, obviously. And two, this is a major update to her design that we've rarely seen outside of when she transformed into Sheik. So by shortening Zelda's hair, that means that we're supposed to see her as an adventurer now. Considering that she spent the better part of a century sealing Ganondorf, it's no wonder that she wants to be out by Link's side this time. However, I also see this haircut as being a move for Zelda to become more independent. And by cutting her hair, Zelda is abandoning the parts of her that have shackled her down. And though her scout outfit stays largely the same, she does have a new capelet with Triforce motifs to match the rest of the ones on her scout outfit. A triangular pin sits on the lapel of the capelet. And for a touch of extravagance, her fastenings are gold. Showing that no matter where she goes, Zelda is the princess of the Kingdom of Hyrule and she is their servant. This theme of self-actualization becomes even more interesting when her path converges with that of the Zonai race. Of course her closet gets bigger, she's the Princess of Hyrule. I'm sorry, Queen. But I do have a confession to make. I'm terminally ill, with stupid bitch disease. I can't help it, I used to think that Naruto was worth watching until I saw the light of day. I'ma be real, the whole reason for this video essay is so that I could rectify my mistakes in my TikTok character design analysis series for Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Like, 
Listen to the shit. And the accessories are clearly made out of wood, so it makes me wonder if this happens to be a Sheikah motif. <laughs> Stupid bitch. Though since I'm at the pulpit, I will argue that I always avoid trailers for anything that I'm hotly anticipating. And when you pair that with terrible memory, you're not going to remember a lot of the finer details. So after reviewing all of the teaser trailers in order, that's when I started to pick up on a lot of these hints and how we are going to have a deep connection to the Zonai in Tears of the Kingdom. And how this connects back to Zelda is her apparent meeting with the mysterious Zonai that we've seen only featured in this trailer as well as leaked concept art for the collector's edition of Tears of the Kingdom. An individual whom I'm going to assume is incredibly important to the lore of the Zonai since we've seen them inscribed in stone on these ruins. At my time of recording this previous to May 12th, we are currently referring to her as Basket Girl. And yeah, she's super cute. She's a tall, beautiful woman with long blonde tresses and prominent hyaline ears. She is a tan-skinned woman with white markings dictated throughout, taking on similar grid-like shapes to Link's arm. As we can see in the pre-launch trailer, she is also dressed in the exact same gown and attire as Zelda. Admittedly, its shape is a much more detailed version of Zelda's Hylia gown, except in red, white, and dark blue. Although it is adorned with a litany of Zoina accessories, such as triangular fringe trim on the dark blue scarf running down the center of her dress, running along her dress also appears to be a chained wooden accessory that's similar to the one that Link is sporting in his new armor in Tears of the Kingdom. Her long lashes and soft cat-shaped eyes with a gentle smile are evident of her kindness and the fact that she's wearing a laurel crown sitting above her ears and her exposed feet demonstrate her closest-knit nature. A quality that's translated into her nurturing attitude, especially with the way that she's clutching at that basket of flowers. It's very evocative of the energy that Aerith gave off in Final Fantasy VII. In comparison to their Hylian counterparts, I can see that the Zonai are dressed in much more naturalistic themes, save for the occasional bauble and trinket, such as these diamond-faceted earrings that are found on both Zelda and this mysterious basket girl. And the fact that this woman is so carefully dressed in an elaborate manner makes me wonder, what is her connection to Zelda, who is also wearing the exact same dress that we see here in the pre-launch trailer? And honestly, the conclusion I've come to just from looking at the trailers is that she's probably the Zonai version of Hylia. My theory is that the Zonai people were once tasked with the impossible job of sealing Ganondorf, something that would eventually lead to the destruction of their kingdom. I can only imagine that is the case that they got wiped out by Ganondorf because there's barely a single trace of them. And because the pre-launch trailer does show us Zelda falling into a deep chasm before Link can rescue her, while he's also getting a new arm upgrade that seems to also be suppressing Ganondorf's powers, it's most likely that Zelda found herself in an underground Zonai refuge. And I know, I just dumped so many words on you guys right now, but this is very important in the story that's being told with Zelda's new dress. Because I do believe that in her newfound sense of helplessness after aiding Link on his adventures and being by his side, she now feels even more isolated as she's attempting to reach out to Hylia for help. And if the Zonai were really the people who were standing between Ganondorf and utter destruction, it would make perfect sense for Zelda to enlist the help of this woman who suspiciously seems to be able to wield the light force as we can see from the pre-launch trailer, because now she is desperate for a solution, henceforth she is turning to myths and legends rather than technology and science in order to find a new solution. And the Hylia theory is only further supported by the presence of that tear gem, the same gem that we see Zelda hold later on. And hey, I'm gonna tell you guys right now, I didn't have the answer to this when I first saw this gem. But Google does! which is well where I found out where I've seen something similar. It appears that the shape of this gem is based off of the sacred tears that are found in the Silent Realm throughout Skyward Sword. There being four gems in total, each one representing the goddesses Nehru, Farori, and Din. Though the fourth gem, not explicitly stated, appears to be a representation of the Light Realm. But the presence of these four sacred tears are not only found on Zonai Hylia, but they can also be found in the art of the Zonai ruins. Looking at our mysterious Zonai figure, he is surrounded by the four sacred tears, or at least gems that resemble the shape of them. Now, as we understand from Breath of the Wild, there was not a clear distinction or presence of the Triforce. There didn't really seem to be any Triforce of power or courage, aside from the Triforce of Wisdom. Now, what I wanted to conclude from that is that perhaps the Sacred Tears are meant to be the stand-in for the Triforce pieces. Rather than the Triforce in this version of Legend of Zelda being a representation of the power of light bestowed upon humans from the Goddesses of Light, the Tears were probably a manifestation of that power instead. Henceforth, the reason why we will later see in this analysis, Ganondorf is also in possession of a gem that looks very similar to the one in the possession of Zelda and Zonai Hylia. It's far too much of a coincidence for both of these people to actually have gems that look very similar to the one in possession of Ganondorf. Twice we have seen these gems depicted in art in the form of tattoos as well as Ruin's art. I can only imagine the fearsome power that all of these tear gems would possess if combined together. And if they resemble the sacred tears at all from Skyward Sword, this just means that it's another representation of the touch of divinity from the goddesses of light. 
Because of these elements being put on display for us, I can't help but assume that this is supposed to be a passing of the torch moment between Zonai, Hylia, and Zelda, the current queen of Hyrule, destined to meet Ganondorf on the battlefield. Speaking of... Dark Lord, Demon King, Emperor of the Dark Realm, Ganon of the Enchanted Thieves, Gerudo King of Thieves, Great King of Evil, Mandrag Ganon, Prince of Darkness, Calamity Ganon. He is known by all titles, but he is still the same eminence of chaos. But surprisingly, as we can see from his Tears of the Kingdom official artwork, Ganondorf seems more like a regular Gerudo man rather than a entity. His red bushy brows amplify the glare that he shoots directly into the viewer's soul, his square jaw only further amplified by his prominent cheekbones that sit right below his eyes. His stance is squared and stout, his arms resting in clenched fists at the sides of his body. They form a perfect square when we connect the points to his feet, which are also firmly planted on the ground. Sinister confidence radiates off of his chest as he stands proudly with his back straight. An indication of a man who has spent so many hours on the battlefield that he is very aware of his clear power and might over others. As we had discussed earlier, his posture creates a perfect square shape from the beginnings of his shoulders down to his feet. Now squares and rectangles alike within the lexicon of shape language are supposed to be shapes evocative of the strong, sturdy, reliable, supportive, and sometimes stubborn. To say that the community has been in a frenzy trying to figure out what Ganondorf's role is going to be in Tears of the Kingdom is an understatement. I have never seen such a giant output of cultured art if you catch my drift. That's been scattered throughout the internet like the Triforce Shards and Wind Waker. Yes, I'm still fucking bitter about that, by the way. Anyway, it was interesting to see all of these theories because never before have I actually seen people theorize about Ganondorf. And I absolutely believe that character design choice was made with that idea in mind. And that design choice is only made clear when we look back at his older designs. Now, if we look as far back as the original Legend of Zelda, Ganondorf has been defined as some type of demon lord. And then when we get to Orcarina of Time, he is the leader of a band of thieves and then the self-styled king of Hyrule. Orcarina of Time's version of Ganondorf is arguably the most popular one, seeing as how it is the first entry in the Legend of Zelda series where we get to see Ganondorf in his Gerudo form. It was popular enough to be featured in Super Smash Bros. Melee, and the same version was also carried over into Twilight Princess, which is also the apparent sequel to Orcarina of Time, but I'm not going to get into that timeline because we have Hyrule Historia and Making of a Champion for a reason. As I had mentioned, it's not only the human version of Ganondorf that we get to see, but we also have the bestial or more demonic version of Ganondorf, otherwise known as Ganon. There was a lot of fan speculation on whether or not these are two separate versions of Ganondorf or they're one and the same. And it was then later confirmed in the Hyrule Historia that Ganondorf is the human version, whereas Ganon is the demon or bestial animalistic version of the same character. Essentially, there are two sides of the same coin. I could go so much deeper to the point that this turns into a Legend of Zelda colonoscopy, but I'm not going to waste your guys' time like that. Oh! Instead, let's use that little history lesson that we just went over and review the character design hints that we got to see for future Ganondorf in Tears of the Kingdom. Although it has not been confirmed by God himself, that did not stop fans from speculating on the identity of the corpse that was discovered by Link and Zelda in the 2019 Breath of the Wild teaser trailer. As the camera pans to this corpse that seems to be covered in malice, these black and red tendrils that terrorized us throughout the first game, we see that there is a glowing hand made of emerald gold with gold arches seemingly holding or suppressing that corpse from arising. Now when we pause here, we do see that there are three significant identifiers to confirm that this is Ganondorf. The green-gray skin, the long red hair, and the gemstone that is embedded into his forehead. Now another hint that this is the same Ganondorf that we see in the pre-launch trailer for Tears of the Kingdom are the bangles that are on his right arm, specifically. They also match the style of the other accessories that we see on the Gerudo woman, such as Riju which only further supports fan theories that this corpse does belong to Ganondorf, it's just stuck in cryostasis waiting to be revived. By the way, I think Nintendo should totally capitalize on the whole Ganondorf is my BF phenomena with a slippery one wet sign. Because I do not feel safe talking about this man right now, because I can hear you barking at the screen. <laughs> you know what, honey, you do your own thing, even though I don't know where you're coming from. Rather than wearing robes that are bedazzled with jewels, this Ganondorf is very simple. He dresses himself like a wandering Myrmidon, with sashes that seem to have the lining of the tap tapestry from the opening events of Breath of the Wild. To offset the bright color palette of the lining, the tunic is in black and red, similar to all of his older designs. 
With bushy brows that seem to be connected to the rest of his head of hair, and you can't forget the sideburns, which are also connected to his beard. Although the key difference here is that he doesn't keep his hair long or short, much like Hyrule Warriors or Orcarina of Time's Ganondorf. He decides to go for a choice in between the two, opting to keep his long red hair in a low ponytail, which is clearly to indicate that he is an extremely athletic character who's prone to moving around, henceforth they can't have their hair waving around. Luckily, his hairline is doing a lot better than Orcarina of Time's Ganondorf. Oh and to add a little bit more to the warrior mystique, he even has this top knot. It's simple, it isn't fussy, it's an indication that Ganondorf isn't someone who really worries about his looks that much. I'm quite happy with a lot of the samurai and ronin elements that were incorporated into this design. And honestly, the katana style sword and the man bun just helps tie it all together. This Ganondorf seems like a very simple man, electing to keep his outfit together with a white sash, and he even has some sadashi, or otherwise known as white bandages, that samurai would historically use as protection underneath his robes. And if you've been watching anime for as long as I have, Elder Weaves, what's up? <laughs> Sarashi is meant to indicate the character is resilient or tough, further supported by the fact that Ganondorf lacks any foot. An interesting thing to note, especially when we look at how all of the Gerudo women in the current timeline in Breath of the Wild are wearing shoes. It gives me a really good idea of where his priorities lie. Like, for example, with the way this Ganondorf is dressed, he's someone who wants to move as quickly as possible on the battlefield, and with the way he's clutching that sword, you can tell that he prides himself over his warrior prowess. However, another interesting thing of note are the golden accessories on Ganondorf. Going back to Niju, for example, I can see that the necklace that Ganondorf is wearing is very similar to some of the articles that she's worn in Breath of the Wild. Now, with simple character designs like this, I tend to assume that if they're wearing any type of jewelry, it's a subtle way of indicating their wealth or possibly their status as a royal. But in Ganondorf's situation, I like to see it more so as a declaration of his Gerudo heritage, which is an absolute shocker considering that this is the same society of people who ousted him. Which leads me to believe that even though he was banished by the Gerudo, I do think that he does take great pride in where he's come from. But let's say that Ganondorf is trying to indicate that he's of royal heritage among the Gerudo. After all, in the Tears of the Kingdom pre-launch trailer, he does say that- Do not look away. You witness a king's revival and the birth of his new world. And I'm wondering if you guys are seeing the same thing as I am when I look at his hair. Notice how there seems to be a little crown that's holding up his ponytail? That golden accessory seems to resemble a crown, but it's not nearly as grand or opulent as Niju's. Niju's crown, for example, looks like the shining sun rising out of the horizon. Its size and opulence is meant to indicate to the viewer that she is the true queen of the Gerudo. Meanwhile, Ganondorf's accessory looks more like a tiara or a diadem rather than a crown. In a way, it's almost indicating that he is a lesser king or not of true noble descent. So from what we have gathered about Ganondorf's past history, it does make me wonder if this was something that he used to crown himself as the apparent king of the Gerudo. And I would be a fool to mention that, but not the tear that is embedded into his forehead in lieu of the traditional gemstone that we've seen in past iterations of Ganondorf. Whereas previous iterations of Ganondorf's gem looked more like a crown that spread like a spider throughout his skull, this version looks like grafted gold that has been embedded into his forehead. As we saw with the portions of the trailer featuring Zelda, where she's clutching a yellow tear in her hands. Because Ganondorf is apparently in possession of a tear that he has used to crown himself, it does make me wonder if perhaps he has had stolen that tear from the Zonai people. So Ganondorf does as his predecessors did, he decides to take matters into his own hands by getting a hold of a magical artifact that allows for him to amplify his natural affinity for dark magic. And understandably, I sound very insane right now rattling off all of these theories, but I also want to point out Ganondorf's ears. I never thought I would be talking about that within my 20 some odd years of existence, but here we are. Now we have made several comparisons between Ganondorf and the Gerudo tribe. But something I don't see discussed enough is how the Gerudo people in Breath of the Wild have pointed ears much like the Hylians, in comparison to the past where they had rounded ears, like Ganondorf. I'm sure this is probably another incidence of retcon, seeing as how we did see their symbol get changed over the years. But the character design theorist in me can't help but wonder if this is supposed to indicate how Ganondorf has fallen from grace. What you're seeing on screen here is the official info guide for A Link to the Past regarding the physical characteristics of the Hylians. It goes on to explain that the pointy ears are supposed to be a way for them to receive messages from spirits or goddesses. Now in past iterations, the Gerudo tribe had rounded ears, possibly because they were so far apart from the Hylians and they didn't have any inbreeding with them resulting in earlier versions of the Gerudo tribe keeping their rounded ears. Personally, I believe that this indicates two things about Ganondorf. One, that he comes from a distant part of the Gerudo timeline, which would also explain his skin tone. But the second thing that I think this indicates is how he has fallen from grace so far, 
that he cannot even receive messages from spirits or the goddesses of Hyrule. Imagine being made of so much malignant energy that you are unable of being in tune with the gods or goddesses no matter how powerful you are. I am literally too broke to afford this game on release day, so if I am right guys, please let me know in the comments. But like I said, I like to believe that this version of Ganondorf that we're seeing is more of a wandering warrior. I really need to stop fucking stressing myself out like this. I tried so hard to get this video out in time before the release of Tears of the Kingdom, but you know what? Hey, things happen. Something that I made with my two brain cells rubbed together and my hands is still better than nothing. And to any of you guys who stuck around till the end, thank you so much. I saw the love and support that my Rise of the TMNT video essay received, and I'm blown away. As of editing this video, I believe the views on my Rise of the TMNT video essay is like about 2.7k or like 23k oh my god which is pocket change when it comes to views but it's a lot more than i thought i would have ever gotten so with that being said if you like these types of videos where we do a deep dive on the character designs of a given series be sure to hit the subscribe button and hey if you guys are interested in short form analytical content then check out my tiktok at vivi with a v 2.0 i post character design analysis every day and the 2.0 in the username stands for my backup account which i unfortunately had to start after getting banned at around like 8k on my old tiktok got a very terrible hidden revenue so yeah if you guys are looking to support me off of youtube feel free to follow but that's it from me thank you i love you take care of yourself i hope you're having a good day and i hope that you're having a blast playing tears of the kingdom right now because i'm too broke to afford a 70 dollars game so please have fun for me anyway i've been vicky that's it and goodbye <laughs>